This week on The Short Game, we attempt an interview. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is the show where we discuss short games, the kind of games that you can finish in an evening or a weekend. We talk about fitting games into your life. I'm really, really excited about this particular episode because we've got on the show with us today uh, a person who's really a kind of Olympic-level fitter of games into his life. Uh, You may have caught his article recently on Kotaku, uh, which was titled How to Beat 400 Games in 4.5 Years. Really an amazing read, and that's where I became aware of uh, David Heinemann. Um, But we've got him on the show today to talk a little bit about his quest to complete his backlog of games and uh, some of the games that have stood out to him. He's a real-life scholar of video games. Uh, David is an assistant professor of communication studies at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania and author of a forthcoming book, uh, Thinking About Video Games, Interviews with the Experts. Uh, He also hosts the long-running Racket Boy podcast, a podcast about uh, games collecting, uh, interviews with game designers, and uh, getting through your backlog of games. It's a really great listen, so you should check that out. Thanks so much for coming on the show, David. Sure, I'm happy to be here. Of course, I am your host, Reagan Kelly. Uh, and I am joined once again this week by my great co-host and fancy podcaster, Nate Heininger. How are you doing, Nate? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Awesome. I'm super excited. So, David, um, your article is really fascinating. Uh, but when I got a chance to read a little bit about you, I was really interested because I think you're the first person that I've gotten a chance to talk to, you know, over the Internet or in person who actually kind of studies video games as a part of your professional career. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I was wondering if we could just start a little bit by talking about your history with video games, talking about your, uh, uh, your bio. And for example, have you always been a gamer or when did you get started with video games as a hobby? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm 34. Uh, so like, like a lot of people my age, uh, I, Grew up in the uh, sort of the, t- the very beginning of the 8-bit era. It was the first uh, first time I remember having my own console at home. Uh, my first video game playing machine was a Texas Instruments uh, 99-4A, and nice. uh, and nice. Uh, so I you know uh, so I was probably uh, I, have, I have a five year old. I was probably about his age when I guess I started playing games and uh, never really stopped. Uh, there are periods you know teenage years or college years where sometimes. Uh, there would be more game playing or less game playing, depending as you know how life goes. Um, it probably, certainly not as much in uh, graduate school uh, as I might have uh, might have preferred, but you know other other demands, right? So, uh, yeah, I've been a, a lifelong gamer. Um, I, I've never really, until uh, the beginning of the period for the, the article, uh, tried to have a, a focused uh, attempt to get through a lot of games. I just kind of played games on a whim or played a little bit of this and then went to something else. And not that I never beat games, but uh, it wasn't... Uh, it, I think it, had a, it has a relationship to the other thing that you mentioned, which is uh, starting to think about incorporating games into my research. And uh, I, I felt at that point, in order to, to have some credibility to talk about the thing I've been doing as a hobby through my life, uh, you know, in addition to reading widely and writing and doing other kinds of things, uh, I should gain as much firsthand experience with as many games as possible. So... Uh, which is something that, as you read people who do study games and, and do game studies work, is the, the, what the field is called, um, you get a sense that that's not usually the case. Uh, that they might some some people might have a lot of knowledge about a few things or kind of bits and pieces and pockets of knowledge, but there aren't a lot of people who, at least by their writing, impress me as having a pretty broad knowledge of the the history of the game medium beyond like maybe knowing titles and what a game is about actual playing history is is something that I think is important. I could totally see that uh, having actually completed a lot of games and really getting that play experience is pretty important to kind of gaining that credibility. I know that with video gamers, um, you know, right or not, there's something about video game culture that, you know, really has a people constantly question people's credibility as, you know, 
You have an opinion about about Zelda Ocarina of Time? Well, pff, what gives you the right to have that opinion? And so I think it, it makes sense as a video game researcher to really spend the effort to kind of dig in and play those games. How did you really get started with deciding to study video games academically? Uh, that, that actually came uh, right around the same time that I got, uh, around the time I got tenure. So um, it's definitely a sort of post uh Postgraduate school, post focus of my my early years as a professor uh, work. It's it's something that is because it's a uh, a field that's fairly small. Uh, it's a field that's actually been around for quite a long time, but one that uh, there aren't a lot of like departments of game studies, and there aren't a lot of faculty hired to do game studies work. I'm I'm hired in a communication studies department. Uh, I wasn't hired to do game stuff, but um, you know it's it's something that it it wasn't uh, at least when I was going through graduate school something that I it made sense to focus on at that time, uh, but what I did focus on as a, as a graduate student uh, was uh, uh, new media technologies in general. So my dissertation uh, work was about hacktivism, uh, sort of the history of computer motiv- uh, politically motivated computer hacking, and uh, looking at uh, different. Uh, political persuasive strategies and the types of things that they've used historically, uh, how that lines up with uh, the way that we understand social movements to work historically. Uh, so I, I did work on that, uh, on hacking. Um, I, so I did you, some uh, sort of other pop culture media work and you know, the segued into games pretty nicely. Are you saying you academically spent time on things like 4chan? <laughs> and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was part of uh, part of what I looked at. I mean, the, for the dissertation, uh, one one of the things that was kind of fun in, in studying hacktivism. And this is my dissertation work. I was over in two thousand and seven, so this was before like WikiLeaks or uh, Anonymous and a lot of these kind of more recent movements. But um, and and really, 4chan doesn't factor into it too much, even uh, given <laughs> yeah, the time. But, a... <laughs> um, but but there are like a lot of uh, really sort of interesting independent. Uh, Websites and publications and uh, other, you know, media uh, produced by uh, hacktivism groups historically, uh, dating back into the the nineteen nineties and, uh, and and some before, debatably, depending what you count. And uh, so, a lot of that research was, you know, again with any other subject, uh, if you're going to speak about it, you should research it. You should have some credibility. You should know primary source materials. And uh, so, I did that with that topic. Uh, I turned that into a uh, a book about uh, politics and new media more generally, beyond just sort of activist politics, but also party politics and so forth. Um, and when that book finished up, so I guess that book came out in 2012, um, and I'd started this backlog project kind of as that book was was going coming together. Um, and, and so it was a pretty natural transition to move from finishing that book into uh, thinking about working on the stuff that I was doing for fun uh, and, and, and moving it into a little bit more serious direction. Had you always been sort of a collector of games as well? Because it seems like a lot of this kind of came together as part of your games collecting as well. Yeah, uh, not. I mean, I, I certainly have uh, regret stories uh, of you know teenage years of sending bringing things into GameStop that I wish I hadn't, or those kinds of things. But oh, that's um, yeah. But for the most part, you know, I, I was able to uh, in the in the years since recoup most of the things I ever got rid of. Sometimes for much more uh, than I would like. But uh, yeah, I've I've been a long time collector as well. So uh, I guess I probably that's the one thing I did do. Uh, probably starting uh, two thousand two or three, um, started just by picking up some games for systems that I still had kicking around from my uh, from my youth and my teenage years. So like I'd, I'd had a uh, Sega Genesis and Sega CD and the Sega 32X system uh, when <laughs> I, I, when I was, uh, was in high school. And um, I, I kept it. And uh, so I guess it started by just kind of picking up some cartridges for that that I'd never picked up in the 90s or, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Very sort of slowly moved into it. And, um, you know, as you do that, if you happen to stumble across one or two good lots, uh, hmm. you know, all of a sudden you have these other systems that you never had. Then you got to try them out and check out their libraries. And uh, that was actually... You mentioned uh, that I host, host the Racket Boy podcast. Uh, my initial interest in that site was because they they have these great lists that they've had for you know ten years almost now of um, you know the best hidden gems for this system or that system or the games that you need to look for when you're out hunting. And those those get revised uh, from time to time. They're probably not exactly the same now as they were then. But uh, for someone getting into collecting, uh, it was a great resource. And so. I absolutely built up a big library uh, before I started thinking seriously about how I might actually do something with it. 
I can remember a, I can vividly remember a very ill-fated garage sale that I had when I was younger that I still think about some of the games that I sold for, you know, a dollar or two just to afford. Mm. Uh, you know, I had all those Sega systems as well. Uh, is your backlog mostly comprised of games that you'd already owned? When you went to tackle this list, did you mostly just look at what you owned and try to complete those? Or was it like a, a collection of things you knew in your mind that you wanted to complete leveled against the things that you already owned? It's kind of a mix of things, right? So the, yeah. the, the I guess I don't think of it quite that way other than uh, to say, well, you know, there, there are a lot of these older games that uh, I know. So, I mean, early in the list, you'll probably notice, like, there's some pretty uh, well-acclaimed titles, things like uh, mm-hmm. Eco or Symphony of the Night or Chrono Trigger. Like, those are all games I played in the first year in part because uh, of, of this process, in part because, you know, they're, they're games that uh, are supposed to be landmarks of their genre or really important games for some reason or another, and I never played them. Uh, and so certainly there was that impetus that these games are sitting on my shelf. They're supposed to be amazing games, great games that defined such as that really inspirational. I need to play them and I need to come up with a way to sort of make myself play them. And, uh, and so, yeah, I definitely had that aspect to it, but, uh, most of the, most of the list, you know, is probably, uh, almost two thirds newer games, right? Things that came out, uh, during the, the generation and the times that, that the list started, um, a lot of this is just kind of keeping current, uh, and uh, so it's it's a mix of those things. It's a mix of you know what's coming out that I'm interested in playing, and a mix of what what can I sort of work in from gaming history that I, that I've collected, or that you know, I I know is supposed to be great and I've collected for that reason. Um, yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, right. My backlog is primarily things that I've purchased on Steam sales and humble bumble, <laughs> humble bundles. And yeah. then my old boxes of games from... I, I mean, I, I, I do part of... This might get to something we'll talk about later that you sort of alluded to earlier. Part of my thinking at times has been, you know, this is a game that wasn't cheap to acquire or reacquire. So, you know, it, it by sitting on my shelf, it's even a greater sin that I haven't played. So not only is it supposed mm. to be a kind of a really amazing, fantastic game, but I spent, you know, more than people would normally spend for an older game to get this. Uh, I really should experience it, you know. So yeah. and with with the humble bundle stuff or the dollar you know, <laughs> fifty Steam sale games, unless I'm really compelled to try them out, uh, I don't I don't have that same push to necessarily get to them right away. So when you are addressing this sort of backlog uh, in your article, you did a great job of sort of outlining some steps that people could take to kind of tackle that. But I kind of wanted to unwrap that a little bit and talk about some specifics. Um, sure. First thing would be one thing that I wondered was, do you play more than one game at a time or how do you how do you structure your time so that you know you're giving each game the attention that it needs i know that for me for example i have a tendency to start games without finishing them and i think a lot of it comes down to trying something new before i've finished the thing that i've begun yeah uh i generally don't play just one game at a time i i I generally have maybe three uh sort of that I'm, i'm working through um, I try really hard not to let that balloon pass like, you know, not pass four. Five is really like that's, you know, if, if there's five in rotation, there's probably at least one of those I'm, I'm not going to finish. So uh, so right now, uh, for, you know, for the last, I guess, two or three weeks, I've been uh, maybe every other day playing like a level of Shovel Knight. Um, I'm playing that, too. What do you think of it so far? If you if you can. Oh, I, I quite currently... like it. It's 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 well yeah. deserving of all the praise. That's probably our next episode, actually. That's we'll what I was okay. playing. Uh, played that for like four hours today. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm playing yeah. that. I'm playing. Uh, I've been playing a lot of the Destiny beta. OK, so that's one. Obviously, I'm not trying to beat. Uh, but me, too. Like, it's, it's it's the hot new thing. And yeah, uh, I want to play it. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, and then I'm, I'm also, uh, recently started up, uh, System Shock 2, which is a game that is another kind of one of those that was cheap in a Steam sale or something, but it's one that I've <laughs> heard so much about over the years. I loved the Bioshock games and I, I wanted to finally get to it and play it. Um, so those are the three games and, and I, uh, you know, I, I try to split my time be- across them. Uh, as I finish one, you know, something else will come into its place, whether it's older or newer, uh, might depend on. You know what I've picked up, or if I've read something interesting that rekindled interest. It's I don't tend to plan out. You know I'm gonna play this game, then that game, then that game. I, there's not a schedule of games. It's just okay. Now I I have something open. What sort of length of game do I want to play? Um, 
you know, what, what have I been itching to get to? Like the new Wolfenstein right now is something that I'm kind of itching to get to. So my guess is maybe when the, best, when the Destiny beta wraps up or if I finish Shovel Knight, whatever happens first, I'll probably dive into that next. So length of games is kind of factoring into your decisions about which games you pick? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know you mentioned how long to beat dot com when uh, in your article and i know that's a a resource we lean on a lot for this show as well because obviously when we're trying to pick short games to cover uh it's it's a fantastic resource um Mm -hmm. but what uh how how exactly does uh, game length sort of factor into your decisions of what to play and when um well i I sort of have uh, a a sweet spot for time right which is either uh, either side of 10 hours, right? So like a seven hour game, uh, is, is really good. It, it, those, those games, even if I'm not loving the game, uh, it's not so long that I'll feel like it overstayed its welcome. And I might get three or four hours into it be like, yeah, this isn't a great game, but I've only got three more hours. I may as well get it out and finish it. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but certainly, uh, that's very genre dependent, right? So, uh, RPGs, it's really hard to find anything that's seven hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, uh, for me, like I, I tend to like RPGs that are between 15 and 30. Um, and that's a game I know I'll probably be spending at least a couple of weeks with. Um, you know, I, I, th- there are some rare exceptions of things that I've, that I've played that are longer. But, you know, I, like, for example, I picked up um, Xenoblade Chronicles a couple of years ago, and I probably sunk 10 hours into it. It's okay. Um, but, you know, people were saying, oh, it's not until, like, 25 hours in that the game really kind of picks up. And, gets, and I just, <laughs> that, that, that to me is not appealing. Um, yeah, and that's like you the know, entire... And I'm sure it's great. Yeah. concept of our podcast is it shouldn't take right. 25 hours to get to the right. good part no i do i do have like 90 hours logged in borderlands too right so oh I mean, there are some exceptions there are a few games here and there where yeah. uh it just really sucks me in but by and large i mean it like that happened by surprise if someone had showed me oh borderlands 2 is 90 hours of gameplay by the time all the expansions come out and everything i'd probably say that sounds great maybe i'll dabble in it a little bit but i, I don't i don't think i'm gonna not play 10 games so that i can play this one game um and, and I'm sure I miss out on things by doing that. I mean, that's it's not a it's not a method uh, that necessarily would or should work for everybody. And some of the comments in the Kotaku article, like you know, you're sucking all the fun out of it. You're not enjoying things or smelling the roses. Or, um, but but because I have these other reasons why I want to play a lot of games, uh, to me, I feel like I'm wasting my time if I spend uh, a lot of time in a game that I could be spending with others. That 10 hour mark is a kind of an unofficial mark for us as well. It's kind of a border between a short game and a long game. Now, it's obviously really vague. And I think we probably covered games that I've certainly spent more than 10 hours on. Um, Well, yeah, I've got like 130 hours into Faster Than Light. Oh, and geez. we did an, <laughs> and we did an episode on that. But <laughs> but each individual game is very short. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's something yeah. actually I kind of wanted to ask you about, because there's some games that really have a much more open ended amount of time that kind of fits into them. You talk a little bit in your article about defining for yourself when a game is done, you know, when is the game over? Um, but there are a lot of games like Faster Than Light, perfect example. I don't know if you've played that particular game, but games that there's really an open open ended kind of ending, if you will. Games maybe that you play um, multiplayer in lots of short games or um, uh, games like puzzle games where there's not really a finite end or a point where you're positive you've mastered or beaten the game. Uh, so I wondered how you uh, how you decide when you're done with a game where there's not really a credits roll with a uh, with a final moment. Well, I mean, there's plenty of games I play that that I, you know, I don't put on the list because I, I don't finish. Um, you know, if uh, so, it, it, this is again very genre specific, mm-hmm. right? So, um, you know, one of the things I, I think I mentioned in uh, the article was that if it's like a sports game, um, if I can get through the season and or a playoff run, uh, depending on the age of the game and how much time I think I really want to sink into it, um, you know, and 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 uh, get to the credits there, you know, ideally as champs, then that game I would count as as beaten, even though there might be know sort of uh, franchise mode and i could go through and do more seasons or create a player and these other things um you know i I, that would be an example of a game some people would say you cannot beat this genre Hmm. but i would count it uh if i for me it's it's beaten if i feel like i've experienced uh sort of uh the main idea of what the game is supposed to be about and played through some sort of dominant you know predominant narrative thread of some kind um you know 
Uh, there's lots of games that open up additional content or side quests and things like that when you beat them. And uh, not to say I never go back and play those or, or mess around with them a little bit, especially if I really like the game, but I don't feel like I need to do those things in order for it to, to count as beaten. Um, uh, can you think of another example? Of, I'm trying to think of other genres where like, you, you wouldn't have credits, but you might be tempted to beat something. Sure. The roguelike genre, I mean, the, the uh, uh, FTL obviously is a member of that genre, but there's been so many games with roguelike inspired aspects lately. Another um, way to think about it is a high score generated game oh yeah games you know, like uh you're okay your so, so just right. to get a high school or i uh, another example was occurring to me i play uh, still a lot of puyo pop fever on mm-hmm. the dreamcast it's a sort of an obsession of mine um but i could never say that there's a point where i i mean i, I suppose there is there are a uh there are sort of a, a mode where you can progress through a series of stages and so presumably i guess you could complete it there maybe not the best example but games like that where you're really competing against yourself rather than against the game to improve your scores yeah so there's plenty of old arcade games that are like this of course right so um and, and there's a couple of ways to do that so uh one of the one of the games that's on my list for example is uh tempest um and uh i played the uh, tempest 2000 the jaguar mm. uh version of the game which has a uh, has a mode that is basically the original arcade mode, and I think it maybe has, I'm probably going to get the number wrong, but around 20 or so levels that you have to progress through, at which point it begins to loop, and the, the levels just replay each other. They might throw more enemies and things like that on them, but uh, you've basically seen all the scenery, all the levels, all the layouts that, that the game is going to throw at you. If you loop a game, like an old arcade game, I, I personally tend to count that as beaten. If you get to a kill, yeah, zone, or a kill, a kill screen, uh, which <laughs> you know, was pretty hard to do, yeah, that, that I would count as beaten. <laughs> If you make um, it to a, a skill, more basic, skill screen, yeah. you're next. A, a, real, a real short example so, uh, would be uh, I finished Donkey Kong Jr. Uh, for, I, I believe, either, either the 2600 or the 7800. Wow. And uh, that, that's a game where uh, essentially there's four levels. And uh, each level maybe takes you know, a minute. And, and then, they, then they give you two levels in a row. Then they give you three levels. So it's, it's four levels that uh, they repeat in a certain pattern until you've seen all of them in an order, and then that whole pattern starts over again. And to get to the end of that first pattern, you have to play really well. Like, it's hard to get through that first loop uh, without dying. But if you're really playing for score, like, the best players are going to be people who play that time after time after time after time after time in order to get, you know, uh, world record scores or shoot for something really high. For me, uh, you know, I'm happy to try to shoot for as high of score as I can, but if I can get through that first loop, I'll keep playing, but I will also at that point have considered it, you know, I've seen what this game has to offer. I, I have beaten the game in, in that sense. But I mean, certainly these are, these are debatable. Yeah. Um, and, and again, some of the comments on the, the Kotaku article was, well, how do you count this game or that game? You can never count this or that. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to those, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have criteria that I feel I can defend to myself and I feel like I can speak expertise about the game. I've seen what it has to offer. Uh, if the, if the designers put it in there, I've, uh, and they intended players to be able to see it in order to kind of get to the end of the game. Then, then I've, you know, I've seen it. I like that. Yeah. There's always going to be people who experience games on different levels or, or understand a game on different levels. And it's, it's really not fair to hold, what you believe is a completed game against anyone else's idea of what is completed. It's I think of games like Skyrim or something like that, where you can complete the game in 20 hours or less. If you really just blow through it or you, yeah, I think never I did it in like 25. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I played, I played like 25 of Skyrim and you know, maybe I'll go play the expansions at some point, but uh, yeah. I considered it done. But yeah. And I, and again, that's just a personal, I, I think, right. Uh, I was a little bit taken aback by, maybe I shouldn't have been on the internet, but a little <laughs> yes. bit taken aback by some of the people who were like, you seemed angry, right? Like, oh, you know, you should not put this game on there. Your list is complete BS now, right? Oh, like, yeah. Right? Even if you take these out, there's still, you know, if you don't like those particular games, there's still you know, 350 others or something <laughs> that would that would be fine for most mm-hmm. people's criteria. So, um, but, yeah. Ah, uh, opinionated internet commenters. Sure. You may have noticed we do not allow comments on our website. <laughs> <laughs> we we welcome feedback, listeners, at our uh, at our email address, info at the short game dot net. Please don't stop sending us that stuff. Um, yep. So it, I noticed that with your list, you just have an enormous breadth and depth of different types of games. Obviously, you had some arcade stuff. You had some longer form stuff, things like, you know, the Skyrims and the the Borderlands 2s and all the other types of games. Having played such an enormous variety of games, I mean, I, I know that 
Um, a lot of people I talk to have their one genre rut that they get into and they play nothing but shooters or nothing but puzzle games or nothing but this or that. Um, are there particular genres or even particular game mechanics that started popping out at you in your collection that you know you're going to enjoy when you see them? Um, I, I, I mean, I mostly like games where you shoot things, right? So, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, usually my answer to this is my, my two favorite genres are uh, first-person shooters and uh, shmups. So mm. uh, what, one of the things that I, I did on the list pretty early on was uh, play a lot of shmups uh, with the expectation of, well, you know, I, I want to delve into this genre and putting them on this list will help me play through a bunch of them. So if I can beat them on a dollar or two, which is, you know, four to eight credits um, or less, then, then I'll rack it up and I'll count it. Um, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I found that while that was a good way to certainly see what the advanced levels of a lot of different games had to offer and to see the credits and to get a good sense of the genre, uh, the more I did that, the more I understood um, how taking something away from appreciating the genre as much as I could if I just try for one CCs or or if I uh, played games that uh, basically start you with one credit and allow you to maybe unlock others as, as you go uh, by accomplishing certain scores or earning uh, earning points that you can spend. So I'm thinking of something like uh, Crimson Clover, uh, which is a, a independent developed uh, Dojin shmup that has actually been recently released on Steam. But uh, the original disc version of the game had a, a way that uh, the longer uh, you played and the more successful you were in the levels, you would earn credits, and you could spend those credits in a store, and so you could spend them on continues, right? So you didn't just you couldn't just continue forever. Um, and and uh, there's other versions of uh, like some of the treasure games, like Ikaruga or um, the uh, Gradius V, uh, had a system where like the longer you played and the further you got, you would unlock additional continues. So uh, in order for me to count a game in the shmup genre now, I either have to one CC it, which which I can do with with some of them, uh, or you have to be able to, or I have to be able to uh, unlock these uh, additional things that developers build in to help you reach the conclusion of the game. So. Um, so shmups and first-person shooters, I'll try and play pretty much everything. Um, you know, first-person shooters are also really good for an experiment like this because these days, anyway, they tend to be uh, five to seven hours, which is you know, sort of you know really really good length to to get through and see all the mechanics and uh, see how level design is progressing in the genre or regressing depending on <laughs> who you ask. And uh, so those would probably be my favorite too. Yeah, as someone who's a fan of the Battlefield series. Uh, at this point, I I play the the single player campaign just to kind of see what the new world looks like, what the new game's going to look at look like. But I don't know if I've actually finished any of them for for a couple generations now. Because at yeah. this point, I'm just like let's let's get online and and yeah, fly, I, I fly probably planes. play. I probably play w- with some exceptions over the years. I've probably played uh, the campaign in first person shooters uh, for about twice the amount of time as I spend online. So if the campaign is five or six hours, I'll spend two or three online. Now there's some exceptions. I spent, spent a lot of time playing Halo or the first Modern Warfare or yeah. um, the Resistance 2. I spent a lot of time. So I mean, there's, there's been a lot of games where I spent a fair amount of time online, but uh, I, I'm, I'm one of those folks who will buy it for the single player campaign. I'm there with you. I tend to prefer single player um, first person shooters. I love the shooter genre, but um, something that sometimes holds me back is that I'm well, part the main reason that I don't do a lot of online play is that I am probably just not playing on the same level as most of these teenage cyborgs mm. out there on the Internet, perhaps just with the uh, additional effort and practice and study you're just better at games. Do you ever come across games that you that you just can't beat for skill or technical reasons rather than just for uh, time constraints? Well, I mean, other other than I, I mean, I'm not trying to sound cocky, right? So, no. I mean, other than, other than like arcade games, where the you know, if I'm trying to beat them on an imposed time limit, um, I'm sure there are games that I've I've hit hit the wall and stopped. Um, I've rage quit a few games uh, this year. Yeah, like I mean, there's been a few times where I've closed the. 3DS as in the middle of Shovel Knight recently. Like, you know, <laughs> oh my! Yes, Shovel Knight yes. is but then, uh, so yeah, much but, more difficult than I expect. Yeah. But then, then I'll go back to it. Also, I mean, uh, one of the games that uh, inspired by Shovel Knight. So for whatever reason, I know a lot of people love this series, and I certainly appreciate a lot about it. But I suck at Mega Man games. Okay? Oh, me too. So uh, I, I, I will. I've played probably the first level or two or three of 
a half dozen or more Mega Man games and some of the Mega Man X games. I, I've really tried to get into that series, but if you look at my list, you'll see there are no Mega Man games on there, which would be great picks because they're short. Um, they're classic games that are well respected and loved, but uh, that that series in particular, I just I lack whatever uh, skill is needed to to really enjoy and and uh, do well in them. So that's not to say I won't go back and try. So actually, I'm wondering if my Shovel Knight run will give me some of the skills I need to uh, to go back and and do better at the Mega Man series. But uh, that's a that's a great example. We've been considering doing an episode on Mega Man Two, but I haven't been able. I I feel I would lack the credibility because we haven't. I haven't been able to complete the game yet. And uh, while I have a lot to say about it because I think it's a really amazing game, it's it's probably not going to ever be a short game episode because I just can't do it, guys. <laughs> Do you, uh... So another another one, the the uh, Souls games, right? So I've tried mm-hmm. both Demon Souls and Dark Souls, and like many many people, I found them to be frustratingly difficult. So even though I maybe put four or five hours into a few of them, I just yeah, that's I gave up. <laughs> cool. Do you pick your? You just said like maybe that Shovel Knights will give you the skills required to beat Mega Man. Do you think about maybe. that a little bit when uh, making your selection for your next game? Like I'm really good at this particular mechanic right now. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to par I'm going to parlay that into you know I, I a successful run. Yeah, I I do sometimes try to group uh similar types of games together. Um so I'm trying to think of examples of this in in the recent past, but um well like one of my one of my well probably my all-time favorite game is uh Devil May Cry 3 and uh I really like the uh the mechanics in in games like like the Devil May Cry games and uh, to some extent what they've done with it and things like Bayonetta. Um, but also, uh, I mean, there's some of that in games like Vanquish and so forth as well, right? So if, if a game like like that comes around with the sort of uh, rapid beat-em-up, hack-and-slash, 3D, you know, very fluid gameplay where you switch between de- com- different techniques and weapons and so forth, when those come around, uh, I, I tend to uh, to dive right into them. And um, I uh, I certainly seek those games out in part because even though some people find them challenging. I really find them rewarding and a lot of fun. Um, but there have been times where I've said, okay, well, I, I finished. So what I'm doing right now is actually a pretty good example. I, for the first time, uh, just finished up uh, Thief, the original Thief. Ah, uh, congratulations. I've never, never played. Amazing game. I mean, I'd, I'd heard all, the, all this over the years. I don't like the stealth genre, uh, but that, that game has made me strongly reconsider. Um, amazing game. So that's part of the reason I, I slipped into uh, System Shock 2, right? Because it's also a Looking Glass Studios game made with the same engine around the same time. I don't expect the skills in one to directly translate to the other, but there is a connection there in terms of the engine and the developers and so forth that helped drive what I wanted to play next. So that, that does happen. The thing with the Shovel Knight Mega Man might happen. That does happen across the list from time to time, but I, I don't necessarily plan it, and yeah. there's plenty of times where that doesn't happen. You know? One thing that, well, I suppose we'll get to it in a minute. I know our listeners are probably going to be interested if you have any particular recommendations of games that you think would fit particularly well for somebody who wants to play a short game, a game that's going to fit into a, you know, a brief slot of time. But actually, uh, something that you were saying kind of reminded me, I wanted to ask you about um, if you have a large backlog, like when you've got this big backlog staring at you, does that change a little bit the way that you think about acquiring games or the lens that you look at new games coming out through yeah absolutely um you know so as i've collected over the years i, I mentioned i've had horror stories of getting rid of things uh i've also in part because of going through this this list uh said oh well you know i i have all these other games in the series and now that i've played one of them i really don't think i'm interested in them let me hmm. trade them or get rid of them or sell them or whatever right so um yeah it's definitely affected uh my my collecting and purchasing habits and those kinds of things um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've picked up over the years is, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize that this developer did game A, B, and C, and now that I've played them and I like them all, I need to go find out what else this developer did. And uh, so, yeah, it, playing through your backlog should. I, I mean, that's, that's just kind of learning more about the, the medium, right? You, you sort of, uh, the more games you play, the better you kind of appreciate certain types of touches or certain types of techniques or certain sub-genres that you didn't really understand before. And and that should drive your collecting and purchasing habits. Although, you know, something like a Steam sale kind of all bets are off because it's a dollar fifty. Sorry, so I, I think that's a fair uh, a fair question that that does happen. So if somebody like our listeners, or I mean, heck, me, let's just let's let's just abandon all pretense. 
I'm in a very similar position to you. I've been collecting games for a few different systems. I've got a Steam backlog that looks pretty intimidating to me at the moment. And um, I've been looking through things like uh, How Long to Beat. And and your your article was a great help because it's kind of inspired me to take a more data-driven approach. But, um, you know, a few things you said in your article, like, for example, you mentioned that How Long to Beat didn't exist when you began your project. If right. you were starting again today, would you have any advice for would you have any would you do anything different today if you were if you were starting afresh? Uh well, I mean I would I would start by using how long to beat. Uh, oh yeah. I, no, I mean yeah, I, the, the uh I'm, I'm trying to think if I would do anything uh markedly different. I mean the the the, the most important tip for me is is the one that uh I started the article off with. Um, which was to to have an online community of people who are also doing this with you, right? And uh, some of the comments I read uh, elsewhere, uh, you know, suggested that the the tips that I gave in that article are very similar to uh, the types of tips that people have for losing weight or exercising or eating better, <laughs> right? In, in that, uh, you know, get data uh, and get a community uh, yeah. around people who are doing the same thing who will motivate one another. And so uh, I think that, you know all those other steps. The things I suggested uh, are, are important. The, the resources are good, um, but you know, it, it, for me, it's it's having other people who are also interested in uh, going through their own backlog, also playing a, a, a variety of games, both older and newer, that you know, in the same uh, span of time that I like to play games in, and and talking about them. Right. So I, I mentioned that it's for me, uh, and this might just be because I. I tend to look at games critically and I tend to want to talk about them and think about their significance and whether the critics were right and all these kinds of things. Um, I really enjoy when I get to the end of the game pronouncing some kind of judgment on it, right? Like, well, like I just did with Thief, like, you know, this game is well-deserving of the praise and it was amazing and look at the studio, how sad now I understand the sort of outrage that they closed. Um, but being able to kind of bounce that around with people, right? And people say, mm-hmm. yeah, like, I'm glad you kind of get it now. Or, oh, you know, now that you're saying this, I think I'm going to go ahead and play them as well, and I'll see if I concur. Um, that that, more than probably anything else on that list, uh, w- was, for me, the most important thing, um, j- just to have that kind of ongoing conversation. And, and there are lots of places on the web where people do that. Um, lots of game forums have a thread like the ones that I was referencing, or there are sites like some of the ones I listed, which, which have um, resources and communities around doing just that. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's not something different I would do, but it's something that I, I would say is the most important thing. That's really interesting. I know for you that that, that community was the Racket Boy website. You didn't specifically link it in your article, but it no, seems right, like a no. very welcoming and, uh, uh, awesome little forum. So I definitely encourage our listeners, if you're looking for a place to do this kind of activity, uh, check out Racket Boy. I know uh, there's obviously tons of others. Uh, uh, I know Nate and I both uh, participate a fair amount on Reddit. It can be a little caustic at times, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good community when it tries to be. And there are tons of other great forums on the internet for you to sort of stake your claim and find other like-minded people. Yeah, I can, I can, I mean, just, just off the top of my head, a few, I mean, so one of the ones in the article I mentioned was RF Generation. Um, they are great for having, they have a database, like that's kind of the main hook there, but they have, they have a thread or two uh, where, where people do this kind of thing annually. Um, CheapassGamer.com, uh, mm-hmm. they also have a thread or two where people do this annually uh, and basically keep, you know, keep a running list of games they've beaten and have a conversation with others. You know, it, it has to go both ways, right? So you have to also talk to others about the games that they've beaten. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, Oh, what's the other? Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Sega 16. So, like you know, for old games, like they they have a uh, they have a couple of really interesting threads up right now where the forum is collectively trying to like over the course of a year play through the entire Sega CD library, or in the course of two years, the entire forum is going to try to play through the Sega Genesis library or something like that. And so someone will say, "Oh, okay, I'm going to play this game now because I see it's still on the list of something that needs to be played. It's in my backlog. Let me go play it. I'll come back." and share my thoughts and then they yeah. cross it off the list. Right. So, That's, I mean, it's, it's finding things like that where there's, there's a group in uh, mentality to, to working on this together for the purpose of sharing information, celebrating successes, like, wow, that's really impressive. You beat that. Or I can't believe, you know, I've never played that now that I hear what you're saying. I mean, that, that's really uh, the, the, the driving force for me beyond that's interesting. the intellectual interest. Yeah. yeah I spent a, a large part of my gaming life involved in uh, a lot of different MMOs, particularly between EverQuest and World of Warcraft. And I don't play those games anymore, mostly because I wanted to try other things, but also kind of a time commitment. But one of the the 
things that always brought me back to, to video games is the social element. And that's hard to find sometimes because a lot of video games, especially nowadays, it really is you're sitting by yourself in front of a TV with a single player game and online games are fun, but you're still not there with other people. So it's interesting to find these communities that are completing games that have absolutely zero element of multiplayer, but you kind of almost make it a multiplayer game by completing it at the same time, talking about it and, and discussing it online. I think that's really interesting. And I'd also say mm-hmm. that if you're not a, uh, if you're not an online community person, there are real life ways to have this same kind of experience. Uh, mm-hmm. I've a member of a uh, couple of meetup groups about, um, well, my biggest meetup group is a board gaming meetup group, but um, I've also started joining some that are related to video games. And you get a lot of the same kind of community aspect out of meeting with people who are also interested in the same things you are and and talking to each other and talking about your accomplishments. So it turns Mm -hmm. this solitary activity into something a little more community oriented. Right. So I know we're about to start getting pretty short on time, and I want to respect your uh, uh, your evening with your family. I'm free. But... I'm free. So whatever. I mean, yeah, I'm, well, I can go whenever you want. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, if you um, uh, if I suppose the last thing that I really wanted to, to see if we could chat a little bit about would be as somebody who's played such a depth and breadth of games. I mean, I don't know if I've completed 400 games in my life, which is sort of sad. I certainly haven't quantified it and, and had intelligent thoughts about all of them. Um, do you have any recommendations of games that really sort of fell within that 10 hours or under mark that you think are really unmissable? Are you talking about current games? Well, actually, not necessarily. We're trying to yeah. also reach back to older games. And 10 hours is really our absolute maximum. Most of the games that we like to cover on this show are ones like, um, in terms of recent games, we've we've discussed games like um, Gone Home or Octodad that you can beat in an hour or two. Thomas um, Was Alone is yeah, another good couple one. of hours. Um, we've we've tended towards indie games because in today's marketplace with newer games, those tend to have that shorter length and are easier to fit into a schedule. But there are a lot of great AAA games hitting that too. And then we haven't really gone back and talked a lot about classic games, partly just because they're not my biggest area of expertise, um, but we'd really love to. So I'm really fascinated if you have any ideas about games that somebody could reasonably, games from any area that somebody could reasonably pick up and with a little bit of skill and a little bit of uh, stick to complete in an evening or a weekend. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, for, for uh, recent era stuff, I mean, I guess I can think of it maybe by platform would be, would be useful. Uh, I mean, first person shooters, I, I mentioned is a genre I really enjoy and they're also all over my list, right? So probably 10% or more of that list is, is first person shooters in part because so many of them are uh, in that five to eight hour range, right? So, mm-hmm. go, you know, if you wanted to go back and play the campaigns and the Call of Duty games, I know a lot of people don't <laughs> do that, right? They tend to be around three, four hours. They're not very long, um, but, you know, that, that would be something. Um, it, uh, on the PlayStation, I mean, uh, the PlayStation 3 obviously had a lot of great indie games, things like the Journey and Flower, right? Those are each couple of hours, mm. um, can be beaten, you know, in, in the evening. Um, as a matter of fact, are probably best experienced in sort of a single setting. Um, th- those are uh, easy recommendations to, to anybody looking to just start to get some games under their belt. Mm. We're planning a Journey episode, although it's uh, it's probably several uh, several months in the future, but that's definitely one that we're looking at. Yeah, journey and flower too. I think they're both. I mean, they're both just uh, games that can be beaten in in a couple of hours. I mean, flower might be an extra hour or two if you've played that. But um, so those those would be examples. Um, you know, uh, things I've played relatively recently on the PC that uh, you mentioned on home. That's a good example. Um, the Stanley Parable. Uh, you can you can find obviously the ending of that quite quickly, but then you can yeah. spend a lot of time finding other endings. And we did an uh, episode on that game actually. Yeah. That is one of my uh, that within the first half hour became one of my favorite video games of all time. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of that game. I, I last year I played, uh, the, uh, the new call of war game gunslinger, which is, uh, so that would be an example. I think of something that maybe not a lot of people have played or asked yeah. familiar with. And what did you think of it? Cause that's been in my backlog since, I don't know, some steam sale at some point. Yeah. Right. That's why I had it too. Yeah. I don't think they did a great job of marketing it. So it's really good. It's, it's probably the best Western theme video game I've ever played. And I, I, I really love the film genre, but uh, I, I played Gun and uh, I, I. That's a bold Red claim. With, yeah, that's a bold claim um, with Red Dead Redemption but, kind of yeah. holding that position for me. Yeah, most Red Dead didn't do it for me, but really? I, I, I have uh, I, I've fallen out of love with uh, Rockstar of late. So the mm. last, in the last five or six years, I just 
uh, Grand Theft Auto 4, 5, Red Dead, none of, none of those games really appealed to me much. So mm. um, I've tried them, but they just they weren't my thing. Uh, so, but yeah, so that would be another one, and it's uh, probably around five, six hours, something like that. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, older games is interesting, right? So for an older game, you know, something like uh, your standard NES game, you can probably beat in an hour or two. Uh, most of them are about you know, six to ten levels. Most levels take ten to fifteen minutes to get through at most. Some of them take five, right? So uh, if you can actually get through the entire game in, in, a, in a sitting, you can do it in an hour or two. But even if you can't, if you spent four, five, six hours with it, you probably could, right? Like you, you, that's when we talked earlier about kind of developing the skills. A lot of getting to the end of a lot of these older games on my list involved playing the first two, three, four levels many, many times until I could finally get it. So it's not that I just went in and played this game for two hours and used save states or cheats or anything like that. I mean, I, for me, that doesn't count as really experiencing or beating the game, right? You have to. So even though the game might say it can be beaten in an hour or two if you're speedrunning or if you're an expert, they're probably really more like five or six hour games to kind of really get the mechanics down, understand where all the traps are and hidden things in the levels and, and, and really nail them down. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, people can certainly go back and play classic platformers or I, I like a lot of run and gun games, um, things like Gunstar Heroes, obviously, mm-hmm. things like um, the uh, Turrican games are great. Um, you know, uh, there there were there's a lot of really interesting older uh, film tie-in games. Like so, there's some, there's a like RoboCop versus Terminator is one that <laughs> is not on my list, but I've been uh, dabbling with a little bit over the last uh, couple of months, yeah. off and on. Um, yeah, I mean th- these these are games that uh, are, are probably not going to be th- something that you beat on the first attempt, probably not the second or third. But as you get in five or six hours of kind of spending it with the game, you'll find you should find hopefully that the mechanics come together and you're able to uh, to get things you know, moving and get past to the end. I think those are great recommendations. So, I, I mean, it, th- th- those, those would be some, some basic recommendations. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I, I think it's fun to go back and play half hour sessions of games on the VCS or the Odyssey two, or, you know, some of these old games where, you know, there's a couple of different modes or if you beat the AI. So like the, the original adventure, right. For the VCS, I mean, mm-hmm. you can, you can beat that game in like 10 or 15 minutes. But a lot of people know that game, like they're familiar with the kind of duck-looking thing, right? They sort of know what it's about, or they know that it had an Easter egg, but they've never actually played it, right? Because it's quite intimidating, can't really tell what's what. There's no system of uh, score or a legend or, or you know, these kinds of things to look at. Um, but if you spend maybe a half hour reading the manual and uh, 10, 15 minutes trying to figure the game out, then after you know that, probably the next 10 or 15 minutes, you, you should be able to get through it. And then, hey, not only do you know what adventure is, but you've beaten adventure and you can speak about what the experience was like and have some authority on it. And, and you didn't spend a lot of time. Yeah. You spent an evening, right? It's that. So, I've never played a lot of the original, like the VCS or any of the Atari games, but that's actually a really interesting idea. I'd like to spend some time diving into those. That's uh, do, you, uh, do you do a lot of researching games before you dive into them so that you have an awareness of the sort of context that they come from? and the uh, or, or do you like to do that afterwards once you've gotten a chance to... to get a feel for the game it's a mix uh it depends on so there's a lot of games that i'll uh, i'll know it's heralded in, in for some reason and um you know i won't necessarily read up a lot about why that is i'll just say okay well this is a game that pops up on a lot of lists as a top 100 or 200 game or whatever um and uh maybe i know a little bit about something that, a little bit about the company who developed it or i know why people like it but i'll just play it and then afterwards i'll go read reviews or I'll go read editorials on it or these kinds of things. I try, I try not to do that beforehand because a lot of that stuff will reveal things to you about the game that you might want to know, right? Spoil, spoil things. Hmm. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, you know, at this point, I guess, uh, one of the things that happens as you collect is you become sort of familiar with, uh, why some games on different systems are more or less valuable, um, why they're more or less collected, um, and, and that's not just strictly things like rarity, right? That's, that's often just because of the, the game is really well loved or it's really well respected. And so, um, I, I tend to, I tend not to have a lot of stuff on my shelf that I don't, uh, have interest in playing at all. Uh, it tends to be stuff that I think is, you know, supposedly pretty good for some reason or another. Hmm. And, um, and so I, I don't generally have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out which of the ones I want to play by, by researching as much as I do by figuring out maybe how long they are or what system I want to hook up, or these kinds of things. Yeah, it's really interesting looking over the, the list of games. 
uh, I've been trying to like keep a mental check of, oh yeah, I've beat that, I've beat that, I've beat that. Nope, nope, nope. It's it's a majority. No, I did notice <laughs> you have um, mutant league football from the yeah, Sega Genesis a, on your list. Played through a season in the playoffs in that. Yep. Yeah. Do you agree with me that that is a franchise that should be revitalized? Because <laughs> well, they tried, right? They they had a Kickstarter uh, to bring it back about a, about six months or so ago, and they didn't hit their goal. Oh, so, that's a crime! Yeah. How did I not hear about that? Yeah, I guess a lot, a lot of people didn't hear about. It, that's so. a crime! Yeah. I had a Sega Genesis, and that's the only sports game I owned for it. Yeah, and, yeah, it's a great game. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, and I think it was just because. I mean, I, I know I don't play sports games so much, uh, so it sort of has to have some other hook. You know, I like the the Mario sports games and uh, Mutant League football just crossed that line. Mm. Gosh, what a game! That's such a shame that they didn't make that goal. So uh, I, I have this other thing I, I put together uh, earlier today because I knew it was going to be on the show that I thought you might find interesting. So uh, I, I went back because I at the end of each year I uh, tal tal yeah. I uh, tallied up <laughs> the tab- tabulated. That's the word I was looking for. I tallied up the, uh, the the number of games in different genres, and so now I, I actually have that for the full four hundred. I can tell oh, you. Oh wow! Yeah, I'd love uh, to hear so, about that. So yeah, so I, the the fifty games each uh, in the first person shooter, and then in the beat 'em up slash run and gun, kind of combine those uh, fifty games each in those genres. So that's, that's a quarter of the list there. Hmm. Um, Sixty two games wow. in the shmup genre, but probably half to two thirds of that was uh, prior to me imposing the the rules that I talked about earlier about how mm-hmm. I play those. So um, RPGs are 36. So just under 10% of the list. So it's, it, I don't spend a lot of time in that genre, but you know, that that's, I still feel like I know a lot of the highlights. Yeah. Yeah. Cumulatively, that could be a pretty significant amount of this by time actually. Yeah. And most of them are 20 to 30 hour RPGs, not you know, fifty to hundred hour RPGs because that would, you know. When you play an RPG, do you uh, are are you a walkthrough reader or do you find that objectionable from a moral perspective? No, yeah, I don't. I don't about a moral perspective, but uh, it ruins the game for me. So I mm-hmm. only consult walkthroughs if and when I get stuck and and after kind of what I what seems to me a a more than reasonable attempt to get over some impasse. Uh, you know, then I'll consult something. So uh, for example, but. A, a, a counter example to that would be I recently played through Eye of the Beholder, mm-hmm. um, the original uh, one of the original gold box games, right? And uh, that was a game that uh, uh, was often criticized in reviews for being something that was designed in part to sell the guide that comes with the game because the guide has like maps with legends and it has like a lot of things that now we kind of take for granted as being put in the game itself, and so. Because I didn't want to sit there with graph paper and try to map out the level by hand, uh, I, I regularly consulted the guide during that game. But I felt that that was kind of a common practice at the time where the game was released for that particular you know, subgenre. So um, th- there are exceptions, but by and large, I don't tend to use guides unless I, I really yeah, get for stuck. Me, for me, I have like a mental you know, equation where my level of frustration is higher than my, my level of satisfaction that I will achieve once I you know, figure it out on my own. Once I've gotten to that point where it's like, I don't even care if I figure this out. I just want to get it done. That's when I go and look for walkthroughs. And I like your perspective about sort of trying to play it as someone probably would have when it was new. I'm playing through uh, Earthbound right now, and that did also come with its player's guide. Yeah, right. And um, so I've been playing through that with the player's guide, and I actually think that kind of richens the experiment experience. It's full of charming graphics, and um, I mean, it's it's written in such a way that I don't think it provides... Yeah, it's it's a little spoilery, but I, I think it sort of overall has improved my experience with the game. And I, I at least have the defense that Sure, but you would have had that if you bought the game off a shelf when it was released as well. So, so let, me, let me give you the rest of these numbers real quick here. So the, the rest are uh, racing and sports, 25, fighting games. There's a lot of fighting games in the list, I'm sure you've noticed, 49. Mm-hmm. So uh, third-person shooters, 21, platformers, 36, and then other, 71, right? So there's a lot of games that don't fit into yeah. neatly into a particular genre. But, um, no, I mean, for me, it was, I, I think that, if you concentrate your attention in that genre that you really like, so really, maybe you really like RPGs or you really like arcade games and do exclusively that is, is another way to, to really get burnt out. You know, I, I saw in the comments some people were saying they would stagger genre. I'll do this genre, then that genre, then that genre. I don't know that you need to do that per se, but I, I do think it's important that if you're really trying to delve into your backlog that you 
make it a point to really mix things up. Don't spend too long on one system. Don't spend too long on one particular genre, one particular developer. There may be little pockets of that, but if you if you really are trying to like blow through the entirety of one thing uh, and you you hit a wall because you're tired of that thing, it could slow your progress on the attempt as a whole. Yeah, and I actually read through most of the comments on, on your article, and some of them did have some pretty good insights like that, or I know another person uh, recommended kind of rotating... Um, like new game, old game, you know, portable games. I, they yeah. had some sort of program that they had made for themselves. Yeah. And I'm sure everyone's going to have their own little way of tweaking that and deciding how to play things next. But I think the idea of having um, having a plan for how to decide what game to play next and that kind of, and how to rotate your time is probably a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. With the fighting games, do you decide that you're done when you've gotten to the end credits or do you have to unlock things like um, unlock characters and things like that for example i can beat um, soul caliber in about 10 minutes but it probably took uh six or eight hours or more of play to unlock additional characters and you know really finish so so for a fighting game uh i have to one cc the arcade mode in order to count it as beaten um, which often means playing that mode many, many times uh, if the game especially has like SNK games with their final bosses and stuff. is a pain, right? So, um, but, uh, so that then if I can do that, you know, that, that's what I would have had to have done in the arcade to finish the game. Like that's beaten at that point. It gives me credits. It gives me the ending of the story, um, you know, that I'm done. Uh, to, to complete the game, right, to finish to 100% it, Yes, you would have to unlock those other things. And there are some fighting games that I really enjoyed, and I've done that. There are others that say, well, I've, I've played through it, I've beaten it, I beat the final boss, and I really don't care to go back to this again, mm-hmm. and I don't. So, I mean, I think that's another important thing to know is that just because a game has goes, goes on your list doesn't mean, like, you now must be done with it. Um, especially the shorter games that you can finish in an hour or two. Well, if there is another hour or two of content there that you want to spend time with... That's probably not a huge commitment. You may as well, right? You may as well enjoy it. But it's when there's another 20 or 30 hours and you've already done 20 or 30 or more, like that, that's where it starts, I think, to be a, a major time suck. David, thank you so much for coming on our show. Um, and I'm really happy that you've graced our podcast with your presence <laughs> and uh, that you've been our, our first guest because I think this has really set a great tone. You are a, uh, a fascinating writer about video games and you are an epic player of video games and we are honored to have had you. So thank you so much for coming on our show. And to all of our listeners, if you want to keep up with David, uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Heineman. And I'll put a link in the show notes, of course. But is there any place else you'd like people to uh, to check out? Uh, I mean, if they if you want to link to the Kotaku article, uh, it's possible they might hear this and not have seen that. So absolutely, uh, that that would be the place to go. And I, there might be like another link or two in my bio there that they could find there. So. But it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. And of course, you can follow our show on Twitter. We are at underscore short game. Um, I've been your host, Reagan Kelly, and you can follow me on Twitter at Reagan K. I spell that funny. It's R A Y G A N. K. Uh, Nate, where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter as well, at Nate STL. Awesome. It was very nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you so Same. much. And um, we'll play that outro music now, but uh, if you want to check out our website, of course, it is www.theshortgame.net and you can send us feedback, and we love hearing your feedback, either feedback about this episode or perhaps suggestions of games that you think would be a good fit for our show. Uh, let us know at info at So we'll catch you next week on another episode of The Short Game.